Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here I am, and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. We say it. Thanks, God. Please pray with me. Lord, we, we do wish to hear this story with fresh ears and to, to see you with fresh eyes, as Zacchaeus did. So, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this is one of those stories that most of us are familiar with. Who's, who's, who knows the story of Zacchaeus? Oh, come on, more than that. Okay. And some of you know the little song you learned. We had somebody sing the whole thing through in the, in the um, 9 o'clock service. Zacchaeus was a wee little hen, and a wee little hen was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, saved her for to see. Right? I don't really know the whole thing. Who else knows it? You know it, Caroline? <laughs> and Jesus said, come down, Zacchaeus. There was little hand motions for the kids. Come down. I'm having dinner at your house today. When we have a story that we know so uh, well as children, or maybe that we talk to children, we, we kind of see it in a, in a children's uh, way. And when Jesus said, you know, come to me like a child with your faith, and that's a good thing, that is a good thing. But sometimes we get in the habit of just hearing a story or remembering a story the way a children, uh, the children do, and, and that's not always a good thing. So, so hopefully we'll look at this story a little bit differently. Uh, by the end of our, our time together here. Um, I, I think kids re relate to this story because, you know, it says that he was a wee little man, you know? And so being wee, uh, children are always kind of relegated to, uh, to being in the background and, and being, you know, being wee, they're down here, you know? And, and so sometimes in a crowd, kids get lost, right? Um, my, my friend Ruben, a uh, pastor, used to tell a story of when he got lost in, in Disney World, you know, and, and he was, he was weedy and, and he was just looking around at people's behinds kind of old, you know, not everything looks the same when you're just looking at, at people's behinds all day. And he said he, he got very scared at one point and he thought no one would ever see him um, to find him again. Well, of course, his parents did find him. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. And you know what's really interesting is that as, as Laura was uh, praying earlier and mentioned this story, uh, you know, she said that, that Zacchaeus wanted to be seen. And I, honestly, my message today wasn't about that at all, about, about wanting to be seen by Jesus. Um, but, but that's true too, right? When, when we feel small and we're little and we, we, we do want to be seen by Jesus. But, but I think of it more uh, as Zacchaeus climbing that tree to get a new perspective. Right? To see Jesus because the crowd was in his way and, and, and he wasn't able to get a good view of this man that clearly he had heard about uh, and knew something was different about. And so he wanted to see for himself and so he climbed up in that sycamore fig tree and um, I had the blessing of actually being in Israel and being in Jericho and being right in the center of Jericho and seeing a, a, a sycamore fig tree. And I had a picture of it. I apologize that we are not doing the pictures today. But um, I have a picture of just the center of that sycamore fig tree and this branch that just stuck out like that. Just wandering out. I wonder if this just really could have been the tree, you know, that Zacchaeus ran up and climbed to see Jesus. It just makes me kind of 
I don't know, nostalgic trees always do. I mean, I've, I've just spent this last couple of weeks up there in uh, North Carolina in the mountains and seeing those leaves changing on the trees. And, and, uh, and it just kind of fills me with a sense of, of wonder always, I think. And when I looked at that picture of that sycamore tree again this morning, it, it, it filled me with wonder to imagine that that might have been the tree that gave Zacchaeus that vantage point to see Jesus and, and to have his life change, like Laura said, to turn his life upside down. That Jesus called him out. Because here's the thing, Jesus is always looking for us, amen? And he really always sees us. We feel small sometimes, we feel insignificant, we feel broken, we feel like we've maybe been abandoned or deserted, but Jesus always sees us. But sometimes we don't always see Jesus. And we need to get up in a tree, <laughs> like Zacchaeus. We need to get up in a tree sometimes, because we get used to seeing the backs of the crowds and following along and, and just thinking that things are just A-OK, -okay because we're just moving with the crowd, like at Disney World, and my friend Ruben just staring at people's behinds and just moving one step at a time. We get into that, that habit and we start to put Jesus in a box and we start to look at him a certain way and think that this is who Jesus is and how he behaves. And oh, that can be very dangerous sometimes, especially these days. So you might need to get up in a tree. I know I do. I didn't literally get up in a tree while I was up there, but I got up in the trees and, and just got a new perspective, even if it was just for a couple of weeks. What do you need to to get up over this week or today to see Jesus? What, what do you have in your way that's kind of clouding your vision that you need to just get above and just to get a new perspective on to be able to see Jesus? Because, you know, sometimes he's where we don't think he is. He's hanging out with people that we don't think he should. He's looking like a skin color that we don't really relate to. He's out there in a lot of different ways and places. And we need to get up a tree sometimes and be able to, to get past what we're seeing and encounter him in a way that's going to upset our minds in a good way, the way he did Zacchaeus. Come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself in a way, but, but, but he invites Zacchaeus into community. You see, Zacchaeus was a, a tax collector. Besides being a wee little man, he was a tax collector. And not just that, he was the chief tax collector. And he was wealthy, it says in the scriptures. Now, we know a little bit about tax collectors back in the day from our scripture study, right? They were, they were people, usually they were Jews themselves. They were conscripted by the Roman government to collect taxes from their fellow Jews. And sometimes... They didn't just collect that tax that was due. They added a little bit on, right? Maybe a little commission. Well, the commission wasn't the bad part, but sometimes they added a lot more. And it became oppressive for the people. And they were hated. They were not welcome in the community. They were not respected. He was very wealthy and very small and very outcast. But when Jesus said, come down, I'm coming to your house today, and that meant that other people were coming there. You, you didn't just go and have a dinner for one. It was always a group thing. It was hospitality. And the crowd muttered. The people saw this, and they began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Jesus turns it around. He said, this man is a son of Abraham. He is one of you. He's part of this community, and salvation is his. Don't, don't get up on your high horse thinking that you, you know, you know who's going to be in the kingdom. I'm telling you who's going to be in the kingdom, Jesus says. And they had to listen. And I wonder how many of them came to the house with him that day and maybe had their lives turned a little upside down. I hope some of them did. Instead of just going away grumbling and muttering about oh, that Jesus, that Jesus, he's never stayed in that box we put him in. 
Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was a wealthy man. But here's the really cool thing about this story, and, and it kind of turned around for me this week, that we, we think of it as, as, as Zacchaeus kind of um, seeing Jesus and having his life changed so that he repents and says, in the future, Lord, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And in the future, if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay him back four times. But really, the, the, the verb, the, the, the way it's written in Greek, I found out this week, isn't a future tense. Zacchaeus is saying, well, I already do this. I'm, or, I'm already, Lord, I'm giving half my possessions to the poor. He wasn't required to, required to do that by the Levitical law. He had to give 10%. But he was giving half. And he said, if I've cheated anybody, I give back four times. He was only required to give back twice. So he was going above and beyond. And, and, and this was kind of his, his claim, his, his defense to Jesus and to the crowd that was listening. He was in a job that required him to do things that maybe weren't so great, but he was doing the best he could in honoring God and giving back more than was required. Jesus, Jesus acknowledged that and acknowledged his lineage and acknowledged that he was a son of Abraham. There's another story from a little bit more modern times uh, about a man named Oscar who was uh, born in 1908 in Moravia, uh, which is today the Czech Republic. It, it was Czechoslovakia at one point. He was from a middle class Catholic family. German speaking in a place called Sudenland. And like most German speaking youths in Sudenland, he subscribed to the German party, which strongly supported the Nazi party at that time. And they were seeking to dismember Czechoslovakia and annexing it to Germany. And when that finally happened and, and it was uh, incorporated into Germany in 1938, Oscar became a full fledged member of, of the Nazi party. Shortly after the war, World War II broke out in September of 1939, a now 31-year-old Oscar showed up in Krakow, Poland. It was the ancient city. It was home to some 60,000 Jews, and it was the seat of the German administration of the Nazi party. It was a, a very attractive place for German and entrepreneurs to go and make money and capitalize on the misfortune of the subjugated country. They were able to make a fortune using slaves of Jewish people. Oscar had grown up with Jewish friends and classmates. He had never really been really close, but but he said, well, you know, hey, the economy, right? And he was like, things are good. I'm going to make a buck while I can. And he was cunning and, and a little unscrupulous. And reminds me a little bit of Zacchaeus, maybe doing a job that just had to be done to, to get some money made. And so he did, and he began to, to do really well for himself. And he employed uh, some Jews. And as the Germans began to round up the Jewish people and, and send them to work camps and concentration camps, Oscar started noticing that things weren't right. He never had any real reason to take a stance in his political uh, uh, affiliations with the Nazi party, but he started to realize that things were not right, the way that, that these Jews were being treated and mistreated in horrible ways. And his revulsion and horror at this brutality began to change him. And instead of just lining his pockets now, he began to see ways that he could make a difference in their lives. So when they would try to assign some of these uh, men and women to be uh, sent in trains to work camps. He found ways to write paperwork that would kind of get them to come and help in his, in his uh, enamelware factory that soon became an ammunition factory as well. Some of you might have guessed the last name of our friend Oscar by now. It's, it's Schindler. Oscar Schindler and his wife Emily. They made a huge difference. It wasn't as much of a difference as he wanted at the end of his, his life, at the end of the war. He, he, he regretted that he wasn't able to help war, but he saw, saved the lives, literally, of for sure 1,200 Jewish people. At one particular point, they were, they were sent in 120 uh, men and women to a death camp, and he intercepted the truck, he and his wife, 
and wrote some paperwork and, and said, no, no, these, these were on their way to my factory. And he's, he saved as many as he could from there. They've been in a, a freezing cold truck with no air for seven days. Oscar's heart got turned around. His, his life got changed. And we know who he is now because of what he did. There's a tree. There's Oscar Schindler's tree over in Israel um, that I, again, was blessed to see along with that sycamore tree in Jericho. It's at a place called Yad Vashem, uh, which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. It's the most powerful place I've ever been to, I have to tell you. And outside is this tree, the Oscar Schindler, that they planted there on his behalf for the work that he did, saving people. Because something inside him told him that that was the right thing to do. Something inside of him told him that what was happening and the way this party was moving was just not the right thing to do. And he was able to make a difference in the lives and the families' lives. Some of the families of the survivors were there for the planting of the tree. He eventually moved uh, to Israel and uh, lived there for a while. But he died, um, he died when he was in Germany, but his, his body was actually taken back to, um, to Israel and buried in a Catholic church right outside of Jerusalem. We've got to get up in a tree sometimes and see Jesus. Sometimes it takes a whole different perspective. I, I, I don't know exactly what it was that changed Oscar Schindler's perspective. We know from Zacchaeus' point, it was getting up in that tree and being able to see Jesus and maybe hear his words right from his mouth. But whatever it is, we've got to make sure that we're seeing Jesus for who he is and we're following him and what he's calling us to do. And we're not following that crowd because we sometimes we just get... We just get in that crowd and we're just moving. You know, you've been in that line at Disney World. It's just one step at a time. And you're just looking at the backs of the people in front of you. So I pray that for all of us, that this week and, 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 and forevermore, that we can at moments stop and think about what we need to do and what tree we need to climb, who we need to look out over, who we need to look around, who we need to look at directly in order to see Jesus. And to hear him. Because he's seeking us because we're lost. Amen? And he came to seek and save the lost. And that's all of us. And it's all of those people out there. And we don't get to decide who they are or, or how it looks. We just get to see Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, there are so many things that get in our way and that uh, pull us away from experiencing you and your love and your grace in this world. I pray that like, like Zacchaeus, that we can find a tree to climb up into, that we can take a moment to just look around and see you doing your kingdom work, preaching your gospel of peace and grace, and that we are not just following the crowds. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us courage. 